Darwin Stout reviews the third session. Again, I'm going to refresh uh, our memory on how, or at least I think, uh, one should review a large scientific book. First, of course, is to read the book. Second is to find the main ideas being presented, then evaluate them against your own personal background knowledge and, and uh, against the uh, background knowledge of others. Think very carefully and critically about it. Assess the reliability of the key points, which are, after all, what the book is supposed to be about. And then write a balanced, fair review to outline what you know, to state your own biases, and then state your evaluation. I'm going to give a summary of Darwin's doubt. The sudden appearance of multiple diverse life forms in the Cambrian was a major unsolved problem for Darwin, and it continues to be a problem. Precursors are rare, mostly limited to sponges, which can be found in earlier strata, invalidating the argument that creatures couldn't be fossilized in the earlier Cambrian or Precambrian, say, because they had no hard parts. Claims that the intermediates are really there are not believed by most authorities. Contrary to our last reviewer last week, claims uh, Darwinian theory requires many uh, intermediates, and if they're not there, that's a problem. The tree of life is too shaky to support Darwinism in this area against the fossil evidence, and punctuated equilibrium cannot explain the Cambrian explosion. New body plans require massive amounts of functional, not just Shannon, information. The work of Yaki, Sauer, and Axe have made it much more difficult to explain the origin of information using Darwinian theory. Steve Meyer's article, which was retracted without good reason, and we'll be going into that next week, has never been effectively answered. The only attempt was on the internet, and it was flawed. Population genetics is against more than minimal changes using Darwinian processes and developmental gene regulatory networks and epigenetic information challenge Darwinism. Several modifications of or alternatives to Darwinian theory, such as self-organization, evo-devo, neutral evolution, neo-Lamarckianism, and natural genetic engineering have their own weaknesses. Perhaps the most profound common weakness is the inability to explain the origin of specified complexity or information. Intelligent design explains information well, and using abductive reasoning, standard in the field, it is the best current explanation for the facts of the Cambrian explosion. It accounts for generating new forms rapidly, generating a top-down pattern of appearance, constructing complex integrated circuits and reuse of parts in different settings. Note all of the positive things that uh, can be attributed to intelligent design. Intelligent design cannot be excluded from science by definition unless the definition is either ad hoc, that is, intelligent design isn't science because I say so, or it also includes Darwin neo-Darwinism. Intelligent design is based solidly on science, unlike creationism, at least in Steve Meyer's opinion, but unlike Darwinism or theistic evolutionism, which are also not based solidly on science, it allows one to believe in ultimate purpose. This, while not evidence for intelligent design, makes the question important. There are three major reviews to Darwin's Doubt. Number one, by Donald Prothero, which we studied two weeks ago. Number two, by Nick Matsky, which we looked at last week. And finally, by Charles Marshall. And this one was published in Science and is available on the internet for free. And today we're looking at Science, the 20th September, 2013. It's in books that are on science and religion, and it's called When Prior Belief Trumps Scholarship by Charles Marshall. And Charles Marshall is uh, from Berkeley, California, as we'll 
find out shortly anyway. And he starts out by saying, the power of scientific reasoning derives from the complex interplay between the desire to know, the ability to reason, and the ability to evaluate ideas with data. As scientists, we have learned how to make ideas dance with reality, and we expect them to be transformed in the process. We typically add to what we already know, often showing along the way that old ideas are incomplete or occasionally wrong. And so doing, and so we collectively build an understanding of the world that is accurate, reliable, and useful. In Darwin's doubt, Steve Meyer, who runs the Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture, also tries to build. He aims to construct the philosophical and scientific case for intelligent design. I, that is Charles Marshall, am not a philosopher, so I will not attempt to evaluate his philosophical argument that in principle it might be possible to recognize the action of a designer in the history of life. But I am willing to evaluate his scientific case for the participation of such a designer. It centers on one of the most remarkable events in that history, the relatively rapid emergence of animal phyla in the Cambrian. Meyer's scientific approach is negative. He argues that paleontologists are unable to explain the Cambrian explosion, thus opening the door to the possibility of a designer's intervention. This, despite his protest to the contrary, is a sophisticated, God of the gaps approach. An approach that is problematic in part because future developments often provide solutions to once apparently difficult problems. Darwin's doubt begins with a very readable review of our knowledge of the Cambrian explosion. Despite its readability and a plethora of scholarly references, however, there are substantial omissions and misrepresentations. For example, Meyer completely omits mention of the early Cambrian small shelly fossils and misunderstands the nuances of molecular phylogenetics, both of which cause him to exaggerate the apparent suddenness of the Cambrian explosion. I like to read argu the arguments of those who hold fundamentally different views from my own in hopes of discovering weaknesses in my thinking. And so even after reading the flawed first part of his book, I dared hope that Meyer might point the way to fundamental problems in the way we paleontologists think about the Cambrian explosion. However, my hope soon dissipated into disappointment. His case against current scientific explanations of the relatively rapid appearance of the animal phyla rests on the claim that the origin of new animal body plants requires vast amounts of novel genetic information coupled with the unsubstantiated assertion that this new genetic information must include many new protein folds. In fact, our present understanding of the morphogenesis indicates that new phyla were not made by new genes, but largely emerged through the rewiring of the gene regulatory networks of already existing genes. A reference one. Now Meyer does touch on this. He notes that manipulation of such networks is typically lethal thus dismissing their role in explaining the Cambrian explosion. But today's GRNs have been overlain with half a billion years of evolutionary innovation, which accounts for their resistance to modification. Whereas GRNs at the time of the emergence of the phyla were not so encumbered. The reason for Meyer's idiosyncratic fixation with new protein folds is that one of his Discovery Institute colleagues has claimed that those are mathematically impossibly hard to evolve on the time scale of the Tam Cambrian explosion. As Meyer points out, he is not a biologist, so perhaps he could be excused for basing his scientific arguments on an outdated understanding of morphogenesis. But my disappointment runs deeper than that. Notice that that's not his major complaint. It stems from Meyer's systematic failure of scholarship. For instance, while I was flattered to find him quote one of my own review papers, although the quote is actually a chimera drawn from two very different parts of my review, he fails to even mention the reviews and many other papers' central point that new genes did not drive the Cambrian explosion. His scholarship, where it matters most, is highly selective. Meyer's book ends 
with a heartwarming story of his normally fearless son losing his orientation on the impressive scree slopes that cradled the Burgess Shale, the iconic symbol of the Cambrian explosion, and his need to look back to his father for security. I was puzzled why the parable in a book ostensibly about philosophy and science. Then I realized that the book's subtext is to provide solace to those who feel their faith undermined by secular society and by science in particular. If the reviews on Amazon.com are any indication, it is achieving that goal. But when it comes to explaining the Cambrian explosion, Darwin's doubt is compromised by Meyer's lack of scientific knowledge, his God of the gaps approach, and the selective scholarship that appears driven by his deep belief in an explicit role of an intelligent designer in the history of life. That's the book and uh, or the review, and there are the references. Um, three is not actually even referenced. It is simply uh, a review of Irwin and Valentine. Um, and while Irwin and Valentine is a book that'll cost you 50 plus bucks to, to get if you want it, um, and isn't in a, a lot of libraries, um, the uh, review, of course, is much easier to get hold of as it is uh, free. Uh, Marshall annual, annual Review of uh, Earth Planetary Science is actually available at the library, uh, and you can look it up. If you, <coughs> well, if I were summarizing that review, I would say there are certain specific if you want to call it that, testable complaints about the book. Number one, Meyer's scientific reproach is negative. It is a sophisticated God of the gaps approach. Number two, Meyer argues that paleontologists are unable to explain the Cambrian explosion, whereas uh, Marshall thinks that they are able to explain it. Number three, Meyer completely omits mention of the early Cambrian small Shelley fossils. Um, number four, Meyer misunderstands the nuances of molecular phylogenetics. Number five, and this is actually five and six together because they're kind of interweaved, although we'll separate them out when we discuss them. Meyer claims that the origin of new animal body plants requires vast amounts of novel genetic information coupled with what he thinks the, is the unsubstantiated assertion that this new genetic information must include many new protein folds. In fact, according to Marshall, our present understanding of morphogenesis indicates that new phyla were not made by new genes, but largely emerged through the re rewiring of gene regulatory networks of already existing genes. Then. Meyer notes that manipulation of such networks is typically lethal. This is actually further on in this same complaint, thus dismissing their role in explaining the Cambrian explosion. But Marshall comes back with saying that today's GRNs have been overlaid with half a billion years of evolutionary innovation, which accounts for their resistance to modification, whereas GRNs at the time of the emergence of the phyla were not so encumbered. And then finally, Meyer has a systematic failure of scholarship. For instance, while he quoted one of Marshall's review papers, although the quote is actually his chimera drawn from two very different parts of Marshall's review, which I think is intended to imply that it wasn't fair to use those quotes together. Um, he fails to even mention the reviews and many other papers' central point that new genes did not drive the Cambrian explosion. Now, I want you to note a couple of things. One of them is what is not there. There's no complaint that the concept that the Cambrian explosion was not really an explosion, but a slow fuse of some 30 to 80 million years. There, there's no statement that the Cambrian explosion really took a long time. I want you to notice something else that is not there, that was there in some of the other reviews. The argument that the Ediacaran fauna 
are the precursors to the violin and the Cambrian explosion. And there is no argument that nothing was being fossilized in the Ediacar in the early Cambrian, and so, of course, the intermediates were not preserved. Which, interestingly enough, was the thrust, the reverse of that was the thrust of the quotation that Steve Meyer took from Marshall. It's like he doesn't want to defend his quote. Uh, when we review part, uh, when we review the quote, and how it was used, and whether it was fair or not, I think we'll see why Marshall didn't want to defend that. Apparently, these arguments that weren't used don't pass peer review. So when you hear Nick Matsky using them, yeah, maybe uh, he's being, shall we say, overenthusiastic. And the reason why the Cambrian explosion, the length of the Cambrian explosion is not disputed, possibly comes from, if you will look here, this is Charles R. Marshall and James W. Valentine. And it talks about the, by the beginning of the Cambrian period, near 543 million years ago, a few kinds of small shelly fossils are found, less than two millimeters in largest dimension. We, we're talking small. Small shellies rose to a peak in abundance and diversity during the period from 530 to 520 million years ago when representatives of living phyla are found among them. During that same period, a chiefly larger bodied invertebrate fauna of up to a dozen phyla and including many soft bodied forms is also first represented in the fossils. So what he's saying is the phyla largely came about in a period of from 530 to 520 million years. 10 million years. I don't think you have um, uh, Steve Meyer arguing that much with that figure. I mean, maybe it was six, you know, maybe it was five, maybe it was 10, but it's not 30 million, it's not 80 million. And I think that Marshall knew that if he argued that it was 30 million to 80 million, that this quote would come around to haunt him. I'm going to deal with the simplest arguments for, uh, that uh, Marshall made first. Meyer argues that paleontologists are unable to explain the Cambrian explosion. Well, actually, I don't think Meyer would say it that way. I think what Meyer would argue is that neo-Darwinians and later on other materialists are unable to explain the Cambrian explosion. The only way that you can make this statement that Marshall does is if you implicitly assume that all paleontologists, or maybe all true paleontologists, are materialists. because paleontologists who accept intelligent design are easily able to explain the Cambrian explosion. Meyer completely omits mention of the early Cambrian small shelly fossils. This is a relatively easy one to deal with. If you go to Darwin's Doubt, page 418, note five, you find this note. Uh, it, this is actually part of a very large note that contains a lot of other, um, it's probably the largest note in the book, contains a, uh, where he got the idea that this phylum, this phylum, this phylum, this phylum, this phylum are all emerging in the uh, particular part of the early Cambrian that he uh, thinks they originated at. and. Uh, it says Hyolitha, Malinkians, uh, Scovstead, Hyoliths, and small shelly fossils from the lower Cambrian of northeast Greenland. Note that some authors considered Hyolitha to belong to phylum Mollusca, whereas others considered Hyolitha to represent an independent phylum. So there is mention of the small shelly fossils. And in fact, there's uh, even a quasi treatment. <coughs> 
of the small shelly fossils. Darwin's Doubt, page 425, note 39. See example, Cooper and Fortney, Evolutionary Explosions and the Phylogenetic Fuse. The Cambrian period 543 million years ago is marked by the appearance of small shelly fossils consisting of tubes, cones, and possibly spines and scales of larger animals. These fossils, together with trace fossils, gradually become more abundant and diverse as one moves upward in the early Cambrian strata. That's the Manichaean stage, 543 to 530 million years ago. So, in fact, Meyer does mention it, mentions it twice, not including a reference that has it in its title, and deals with it a little bit, tells you what the small shellies are, and doesn't discuss it a great deal because the animals that produced the small shelly fossils, um, it is not clear what they are. And some people think that this is the origin of uh, gastropods, and some people think not. So you kind of put, you know, you can put your own spin on that particular thing, and that's why he didn't deal with it uh, that much. But he does deal with it, so Marshall has made an error there. Then he says, Meyer misunderstands the nuances of molecular phylogenetics. Well, without specifics, it's pretty hard to answer that charge. I thought he did fairly well, but um, uh, again, unless you know what uh, Marshall is thinking, it's uh, hard to hard to um, say. It would be nice if he had actually engaged very specifically so we understood what he was thinking. Meyer's scientific approach is negative. It is a sophisticated God of the gaps argument approach. Um, this complaint misses the entire content of chapter 19, where Meyer lists four positive reasons to support design. That's probably the most significant um, dispute that I would have with it. Uh, Meyer actually has responded to all of these. Um, and I'm not giving you his response, I'm giving you mine. Um, although those of you who got the email um, have the, uh, all of the, uh, the email addresses to those four responses. Uh, Meyer points out, and he's right, that technically it's the designer of the gap, but I consider that a technical argument. I think that once you consider the designer of the gap, it becomes pretty evident pretty soon that it's some, some entity very close to, if not identical to God. My biggest response to that is that the God of the gaps is overrated as a put down. It's saying, here's something you can't explain any other way. God would fit neatly in as an explanation, but you can't do that because science will eventually uh, answer that question without God. And if you think about it a little bit, what it's saying is God can't fit in anywhere. That is to say, it's essentially, I won't believe in God, and you can't make me. And while that statement is true for those people, um, it doesn't seem to me to be a proper scientific attitude. Next complaint, Meyer claims that the origin of new animal body plants require vast amounts of novel in, uh, genetic information coupled with the unsubstantiated assertion that this new genetic information must, be, must include many new protein folds. And then a little later he gives kind of a further critique. The reason for Meyer's idiosyncratic fixation with new protein folds is that one of his Discovery Institute colleagues has claimed that these are mathematically impossibly hard to evolve on the time scale of the Cambrian explosion. I think that is a misleading statement, primarily because it's not just a claim. There are published hard data behind that claim by 
Meyer's colleague that's supposedly fixated on this. He's actually done work to show how many changes you have to go from protein A to protein B. And whether there are obvious other functions of that protein. So I don't think that's just a claim there. It's actually published hard data. And I don't think that, uh, that Marshall deals with this. Now, to be fair, Marshall is a paleontologist, as far as I can tell. Um, and so he may not be equipped to deal with it, in which case it'd be nice to maybe have somebody else review uh, the book and say whether Douglas Axe's um, data are are real and valid. But he's claiming he understands molecular biology that much better than Meyer. That's what it sounds like. So this is, but we don't know exactly yeah. what he's invoking. No, that's correct. Just so we get that on the record next time. Um, Yeah, uh, that's right. It sounds like Marshall is claiming to know more about phylogenetics than Meyer. Um, and, you know, perhaps so, but it'd be nice to actually demonstrate that rather than just make the claim. And then the other part is that, the Meyer, that Meyer claims that the origin of new animal body plans requires vast amounts of novel genetic information and will skip over the unsubstantiated assertion. In fact, our present understanding of morphogenesis indicates that new phyla were not made by new genes, but largely emerged through the rewiring of the gene regulatory networks of already existing genes. And that references the Cambrian explosion by Irwin and Valentine. But wait just a minute here. How do we know this? Our new understanding is that they were not made by new genes. Is this experimental evidence or is this a deduction from the fact that evolution needs it and therefore it must have happened? That still begs the question too of how that rewiring occurred and what gave the directions for that. Yeah, and how much rewiring does it take? And does the rewiring require these new protein folds that um, that Meyer seems to have the better part of uh, the answer to say that it uh, uh, that it uh, couldn't happen without intelligent design. So that's to me that's kind of just a claim. And notice that Meyer has already noted that the manipulation of such networks is typically lethal, suggesting that you can't do that today. But the comeback to that from Marshall is that today's GRNs have been typically overlain with half a billion years of evolutionary innovation, which accounts for their resistance to the modification. In other words, they've been kind of solidified in place and you can't move them. But way back when, they weren't so encumbered and so you could then move them. Well, again, is there any evidence for this? None is cited. Not even notes in the review. There's no sequence evidence. There's no reconstructed sequence evidence that says what the original GRN used to look like. There is evidence that we need it if unguided evolution is true, but that's kind of begging the question. of note, and Steve Meyer makes this point too, this is a reversal of the present is the key to the past. That is to say, we find stuff now that looks like it would not allow evolution to take place, at least unguided evolution. It, the usual first assumption would be that way back when, they were pretty much like they are now. And it seems like that's the assumption that has to be destroyed 
before you can make the case that that uh, way back then they were more flexible than they are now. Yes. Doesn't that suggest that the original genetic information had more flexibility to it and was richer in many ways? And that my, uh, at least some of that richness has been lost since then? In other words, it seems to be if anything, more consistent with the creation model where you start with a lot and you're losing stuff over time. Now, you're not being fair. <laughs> no, I agree. I agree. If they were more ideal back then than they are now, that suggests that somebody made them that way. Well, what about genetic entropy? Uh, well, uh, that, that data is good, hard scientific data. Yes, and it may very well be that there's less rigidity, but it would be nice to actually demonstrate that rather than just say it must have been so flexible that you could get from an arthropod to a starfish with no problem. Or from a common ancestor to both an arthropod and a starfish, which is what's being claimed. And chordates and um, whatever else at the same time. Gastropods, mollusks, whatever. Oh, it'd be nice to have some uh, it'd, it'd empiric, be nice. empiric, evi empiric evidence for yeah. that. Yeah, you'd like to have some present to, to be a key to the past. Um, at least that was the that was the old theory of how you did science, if you're doing historical science. Now the final complaint. Meyer has a systematic failure of scholarship. For instance, while he quoted one of Marshall's review papers, although the quote is actually a chimera drawn from two very different parts of Marshall's review, he fails to even mention the reviews in many other papers, central point that new genes did not drive the Cambrian explosion. The scholarship where it matters most is highly selective. This is, you know, accu accusatory of a very nasty thing, but it's done in such a way that um, you can't really come back at it. Uh, it's not frank. Well, well, let's look at that quote. You want to see the quote itself? Here it is. And this is taken straight from the book with no uh, changes, and you don't have to worry about my typing because. This is actually from the ebook edition. Um, it is important to remember that we see the Cambrian explosion through the windows permitted by the fossil and geological records. So when talking about the Cambrian explosion, we are typically referring to the appearance of large body, can be seen by the naked eye, and preservable, and therefore largely skeletonized, forms. If the stem lineages were both small and unskeletonized, then we would not expect to see them in the fossil record. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm hearing that correctly, that quote seems to be defending the selective preservation hypothesis for why there are no ancestors, which um, the, the note, by the way, is Marshall explaining the Cambrian explosion of animals in pages 357 and 372. Let's go back and look at that. Uh, you will notice that the, here's the three dots. Now, if I were doing this, I think I would have put that on a new paragraph just so that it emphasized that they're two, drawn from two different areas. But I think it's pretty obvious that he's indicating that they're, at least this is not a run-on quote. Um, 350, uh, where is it, um, 357 happens to be in the body of the text, 372 happens to be in a note, and if you go to the HTML version, as I'm telling you because it drove me nuts for half an hour or so figuring this out, um, it does not have the quote, but the original PDF does. And um, I was able to locate it. And both of those, in context, seem to be saying that, you know, maybe it's not 
that surprising that we can't find the precursors, the, the missing links, if you want to call it that. Uh, notice that um, Steve Meyer immediately follows this with a comment about Conway Morris, the crucible of creation, and Darwin's dilemma, the realities of the Cambrian explosion, which argues very strongly against that concept. That is to say, Conway Morris says, yes, there are things in there that are preserved well enough. We should see those. If we don't see them, then it must be because they really weren't there at that time. Um, well, let's look at it in context of the book itself and see if we're finding any particular reason to complain about uh, the use of the quote. The, the quote goes, develop, uh, the run on to the quote goes, developmental biologist Eric Davidson of Caltech has suggested that the transitional forms leading to the Cambrian animals were micro microscopic forms similar to modern marine larvae and were thus too small to have been reliably fossilized. There's one suggestion. Other evolutionary scientists such as Gregory Ray, Jeffrey Leventon, and Leo Shapiro have suggested that the ancestors of the Cambrian animals were not preserved because they lacked hard parts such as shells and exoskeleton. So there's two different variations of the hypothesis. They argue that since soft-bodied animals are difficult to fossilize, we shouldn't expect to find the remains of the supposedly soft-bodied ancestors of the Cambrian fauna in the pre-Cambrian fossil record. University of California Berkeley paleontologist Charles R. Marshall summarizes these expl explanations. And there comes the, the quote. Now, that, that seems to me to be pretty straightforward and pretty understandable. Um, I, I still think the quote is defending the selective preservation hypothesis, and I think Charles Marshall at the time would have agreed with it. Whether he will now or not, I don't know. After seeing Valentine, or not Valentine's, but um, who was the other guy that they, uh, um, I guess it's here, Conway Morris's comments afterwards. Okay. Um, and then following that quote, which seems to be saying, okay, here's the standard way of looking at things, and Charles Marshall kind of summarized it in these two parts uh, that he quotes, uh, or that, that Meyer quotes. Though intuitively plausible, several discoveries call into question both of these versions of the artifact hypothesis. As for the idea that the ancestors of the Cambrian animals were too small to be preserved, paleontologists have known for some time that the cells of filament-shaped microorganisms, primarily cyanobacteria, have been preserved in ancient Precambrian rocks. Paleobiologist J. William Schaff of the University of California, Los Angeles, has reported an extremely ancient example of these fossils in the Warawuna group strata of Western Australia. These fossilized cyanobacteria are preserved in 3.465 billion year old bedded shirts, microcrystalline sedimentary rocks. And you know, if it's been there for the, so much longer, Paul, there's no yeah. reason to not have that. Might be of interest to, to know that uh, this is uh, a disputed point. Um, after Schropf came out with this uh, report on this, uh, seven different authors in the journal Nature said Schopf was just looking at graphite and uh, that uh, some shapes looked like a fossil and some did not. Uh, and it was obviously that this was not fossiliferous. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, this is not as clear a case as it might seem. So maybe Schopf was, um, shall we say, over-enthusiastic about his interpretations? Yeah, exactly. Now, that's probably true that, that, uh, that he could be challenged. The question that I would throw out is, is there anybody else who's had, let's say, 3.2 or 2.9 or 1.5 billion year old stuff, supposedly, that, that matches the same general description? Uh, in, the, uh, in Canada, you do find some excellent... Uh, fossils that seem to be almost a couple billion years old. 
So that um, even if so <coughs> it turns out to be wrong, and Meyer's reliance mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. him is not appropriate because he's wrong, um, it would still be true that there are fossils that are better preserved that are, according to the standard theory, older. Uh, these are beautiful uh, fossils they find there in that part of the, of the geologic column. It looks like Spirogyra and uh, Oscillatoria. These are algae. Uh, uh, they they look, look remarkably like today's algae. They look just like modern things. Uh, they're supposed to be close to two billion years old. Uh, um, so the point of it is that even though the specific example that he's relying on may be questionable, the general concept I don't think is. I think there are old fossils by this standard way of dating things that are just simply not, um, they're not been, they've not been destroyed. Uh, there's no reason, in fact, if you want to push it really hard, you can say, well, there are sponges, sponge embryos that come from this area. The small shelly fossils themselves suggest that <coughs> some things can get fossilized. Well, you need to keep in mind that uh, when these became fossilized may not be at all. Uh, the date that they give to the rocks in which they are found. True. Because we have algae living at present, you know, uh, uh, several hundred meters down uh, in sediments. Uh, they're there now living. And uh, if somebody if were to suddenly cook them and, and infuse um, uh, silicate salts or something like that into the rock, they would become part of that rock, and whether it was Ordovician or... They would date them by the age of the rock uh, that's the way they do it, and they'd say, hey, this fossil is that old. Uh, we don't know when those things are fossilized. And the fact that you have living algae, which are the, in these examples in Canada, are in Southern Canada, are, uh, uh, algae, so on, uh, it's a slippery slope here. I mean, you, you need to be careful that there's so many possibilities that aren't considered uh, when you make these conclusions. Yeah, but I think that the point that he's making is a valid one. There are older fossils that are preserved. Why don't we have the transitional forms? And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the part that he fails to mention the reviews in many other papers, central point, the new genes did not drive the Cambrian explosion. Well, I think Marshall, it's fair to say that Marshall believes that the selective, or at least believed when he wrote that, that the selective preservation hypothesis is a um, valid explanation for a significant portion of the Cambrian and Precambrian record. A question: How do how do people conclude today that new genes were not involved in Cambrian explosion? How is this possible? How is this even conceivable? Well, one of the things I want to do before we finally close the book on this is to go back and look at uh, uh, Valentine and Irvin, or Irwin and Valentine and see what their argument is because I suspect that it is, well, the gene regulatory networks can be changed by tweaking them and they need to be changed rapidly because there are no intermediate fossils, so you have to have this happen in geologic terms quite rapidly and therefore it must have happened because you have no alternative. And of course the whole point we're asking is, is there an alternative? But, but isn't the uh, success of a gene regulatory gene uh, less probable than the success of a gene? Well, because you involve a, a more complex system. Yes, and one of the things that's not being discussed is how different is the gene regulatory network for a sea urchin, for example, from that of a, an arthropod? We don't know. And uh, maybe we do know some things. Uh, it, it, it appears that they're different enough that nobody is finding a little tiny tweak here and suddenly you can get to a whole new organism. It looks like if you try little tiny tweaks today, they all die. 
And Marshall's claim is that, well, they don't really all die, or they didn't die way back when, because the networks are more flexible. And of course, one of the things you have to keep in mind is the reason those networks are there is precisely to be inflexible. So that every time you get a sea urchin, instead of, say, a half sea urchin, half something else that, that the uh, genetic material won't support. And there were uh, relatives of sea urchins in the Cambrian explosion. Now, it, what I said is that Marshall believes, I think, it's fair to say, or at least believed when he wrote that, that the selective preservation hypothesis was a valid explanation for a significant portion of the Cambrian and Precambrian record. And Myra was quoting Marshall, implying that Marshall agreed with that proposition. So I don't see that there's any particular falsehood there. But the claim that seems to be ma made is that Meyer can't use that quote unless he mentions in the same chapter that Marshall believes that new genes didn't drive the Cambrian explosion. It's a different topic. It's a whole different topic. And Meyer discusses that later on with the gene regulatory networks. And uh, just because he doesn't say, well, Marshall thinks it can, they can be had for free because uh, they were more flexible back then. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure why uh, Meyer has to say that about Marshall in particular. He's making a point that many other paleontologists, and Marshall happens to be one of them that does a pretty good summary for the rest, um, believe that some of the fossils were too small or too soft and just didn't get preserved. And that's the point. I, to me, calling that quote mining or, or inappropriate quoting seems to be stretching things really tightly. I, I, I don't quite buy that. Now, I will say this about the review that we just were looking at. I think the issues discussed are clear. It's a lot easier to read him than, for example, Matsky. I think that there is less overt ad hominem argument, although there's some subtext of it, I think. And I think there are less distractions like the arguing about the length of the Cambrian explosion, because Marshall knows that's uh, not a good argument. Um, I, I think we can still do a little better. If I were starting a review, I would start it out by the part of the review that I read at the very beginning that says what what the book was about. And then I would say, there's certain questions that pop up at that point. And number one, is the Cambrian explosion really less than 15 million years by the standard geological time scale? Is it real? That is, are there really transitional organisms that are just uh, not being reported? Or does it really start from almost nothing to, to the Cambrian biota, which I think happens to be the case. I think it is real. Is it contrary to Darwinian expectations? I think it is. Is it contrary to Darwinian requirements? I think it is, too. I think that the Cambrian explosion comes close to a, um, a proof that Darwinism by itself can't make it. Is the tree of life secure in the area of animal phyla? We haven't looked at a lot of it, but what we have looked at does sort of raise questions. And that means that the tree of life, if it's not secure, can't be used as an argument that, well, it must have happened that way. Uh, can punctuated equilibrium make things easier? Uh, I don't think significantly easier, and I think Meyer covered that. Uh, how fast can genes change naturally? Meyer covered that. Uh, is there a dispute about the data? Uh, my answer is probably not, in which case Meyer hit it on the nose. Uh, how much do genes need to change to produce, how much do genes need to change to produce new genes? That's a question that none of the critics ever really answers. 
Nick Madsky kind of said, oh, it's easy, but never really cited papers as saying what he meant and never really said what he meant himself. So I think that's some work that needs to be done if you're going to be a critique of Steve Meyer, <coughs> or going to make a critique of Steve Meyer. How much do gene regulatory networks need to change to produce new organisms? And is that change within the ev an evolutionary feasible uh, model? Uh, can epigenetics change in a manner compatible with Darwinism? I think this is one for which we don't have as many answers. Uh, and that's one reason why, even though it may turn out to be the most powerful argument of all, I'm not sure that I put it in the front simply because we don't know as much about it as we, it would be nice if we did. Are there any viable additions to or substitutions for Darwinism that can account for the Cambrian explosion naturally? All of those, uh, Evo Devo and, uh, and uh, uh, neutral mutation and things like that. Uh, I don't think that there are any good ones, but that's a question that should be answered. Uh, and in the light of chapter 19, is intelligent design purely a negative argument? My answer would be no, because I think there are some distinct positive arguments for intelligent design in that chapter. Um, but that's how I would go about reviewing the book. Um, and now it's your turn. So I missed the discussion on Prothero here, but I happened to see it briefly in the skeptical inquiry. So I didn't read the whole thing, but it seemed like part of his point was he was saying, well, it's not really an explosion. It's not really a Cambrian explosion. It really happened over a longer period of time. So it's not that we have to figure out how this happened so quickly. I don't know. What, what was your take on the Well, Marshall doesn't example? make that argument, interestingly enough. But Prothero, what, was, that, was that his main point, or were there uh, other points? <coughs> well, that was Prothero, and also Matsky made an argument of, uh, of similar uh, scope. But he still begs the question of how that happened. So they're just saying it had longer time to do it, but they still don't come up with how. That's right, that's right, and that's the thing. That's not a totally central question. It does, you know, if it is five million years rather than uh, 80 million years, yes, it does make it harder to explain. Um, but those are kind of the inside and outside estimates for this kind of well, thing. Well, didn't Meyer say about 20 million, maybe? Meyer's, Meyer, if you read him carefully, he'll say somewhere between five and 10. And uh, in, in Marshall's quote, it does kind of argue that 10 million is as much as you can expect. And really, five of those 10 million are taken up by the small Shelleys, which is, of course, why um, two of the three people have criticized him for not mentioning the small Shelleys, because that helps them to expand the Cambrian explosion just a little bit more. <coughs> Marshall is agreeing with a shorter time frame for the Cambrian explosion? Uh, Marshall is not disputing the shorter time frame. And you can find Marshall elsewhere agreeing with 10 million years as being a good estimate. Mm -hmm. So, Paul? yes. Uh, I think we need to keep in mind here uh, the, the whole thing. Uh, the geological column is a long time. It's three and a half billion years for life, some say be 3.8.5 billion, so on for all of life. Even you, if you go conservative, it's like two and a half billion. During the first five, six of that time, you virtually have no evolution until you get to this Cambrian explosion. And then uh, here you have this explosion, you, you can call it uh, three million years, as I've seen sometimes, you can call it 10, 20, uh, in my book, I call it 50, giving the evolutionists all the uh, slack we can give them. Uh, this is only 2% of geologic time, and most of your animal file appear in that time. So it's an explosion regardless of what time you, you frame you put in that thing. Uh, yes. Yes. 
correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me like the Adventists I listen to prefer 10 million to six, or 10,000 to six, uh, so often quoted by Ellen White. Why do they want to go from six to 10? Is there some necessity? That has to do with his history, which is a whole different subject from this, but I'll try to uh, encompass it in a very short time. Um, the problems with history have to do with what do you do with uh, Egypt and Mesopotamia. China isn't really that much of a problem. Uh, China actually can be encompassed within uh, two, uh, 2,000 years before Christ, two and a half, uh, something like that, uh, two and a 2.2. And uh, the Indus Valley is, uh, the chronology there is not very well established, but for Mesopotamia and Egypt, it's felt to be fairly well established. And it puts you out at about 3,000 for the first king of Egypt. And then if you believe in the evolution of society, then that first king of Egypt had to have a bunch of sub-kings of various parts of Egypt before he unified the country. So. Now you're pushing out to 4,000, uh, maybe 5,000 years of, of uh, history. Now, if you continue that route, you'll find that you have more uh, prehistoric stuff. And that tends to get expanded out to where pretty soon you're 10,000, you're at 100,000, uh, you're at, uh, uh, for, for the early parts of civilization. So I'm not sure that the answer really lies with being able to expand it that much. I tend to feel that Mina is probably the grandson of Noah, according to uh, 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 according to Genesis uh, 10 and 11. So that I don't see a long period of prehistory that I think that uh, there were possibly very small kingdoms that were rapidly united under uh, uh, Mina, who, who, who is probably equivalent to Mizraim. Recorded history and the founding of languages all happened about the same time, and it doesn't go back that far. That's correct. But... What people are afraid of is, you know, if, if, if uh, Mesopotamian history is, in fact, starts at 3,500 B.C., period, then that's further back than the flood, and you can't have the flood take over Mesopotamian history um, and, and be worldwide at the same time. So... There are two ways of dealing with that. One of them is to say that the dating of ancient history needs to be changed. And the other one is to say that, uh, that the biblical dating, uh, that there were gaps in the, in the genealogies that aren't accounted for. The arguments for that are somewhat sophisticated and have to do with the fact that the Septuagint has a different chronology than the Masoretic text. In particular, there's a, a Canaan that has been added in. Now, I happen to think it's been added in rather than that it's been, uh, that it's been excised from the Masoretic text for the simple reason that the Canaan was borrowed from the first list in Genesis 5, and therefore its appearance in Genesis 11 is somebody's attempt to extend the chronology. And then also that Canaan's numbers are identical to, and I forget whether it's the one that follows or the one that precedes, suggesting that somebody just duplicated the numbers. But that's, a, that's an argument from the text. And, and I respect people who say, well, the Septuagint has the original numbers. It's the Bible that Jesus used. Maybe or maybe not, but it certainly is a Bible that was around during Jesus' time. And it's the Bible that the New Testament used by and large. Um, and 
Uh, it's the Greek translation for those of you who are uh, following and not, I'm not making that clear. Uh, this is the first Greek translation of any book of any size. Um, but the, the Septuagint, if you follow its numbers, you get to a creation about 7,500 BC. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, you can follow the Masoretic text, you can follow the Septuagint, you can follow there being other gaps <coughs> besides just Canaan. Maybe there's more gaps that belong there. And we're not going to call you a heretic. In fact, you hear 10,000, but it, the truth of the matter is if anybody were to be able to prove that 20,000 was the correct number, most creationists wouldn't bat an eye over it. Um, the fact of the matter is that 20,000 years is way too small for any evolutionary scheme to take place. But that's why you will hear six to 10,000 years instead of just 6,000 like the Masoretic text, if you just add up the numbers straight, would give you. Of course, it's nowhere near what uh, Meyer and his, and his antagonists are talking about, which is 500 million years, or 2 billion years, or 4 billion, or 3.8 billion years, or whatever. <coughs> I mean, it's a whole, the Cambrian explosion, what is it we're really talking about? Well, I think that uh, the easiest way of explaining the Cambrian explosion from a short age flood geology standpoint is that the Cambrian explosion is where the animals were located at the bottom of the ocean when the first disturbances that would later become the flood and came onto land started. Now whether they were you know, exactly simultaneous, whether they were day early, whether it's hard to say. A month early, five months early, you could, you could make all kinds of arguments that there was really something else going on there um, and that the Cambrian ex uh, animals were buried bef significantly before the rest of the, uh, uh, the, rest of the biota. But the, the, they were there, and they got buried as the first <laughs> installment of the flood, if you want to put it that way, is the, probably the easiest explanation. And the reason is, one of the reasons it is the easiest explanation is you do find burrows, you do find these small shelly fossils that you don't find, you know. But then <coughs> you do have small shelly fossils today. Uh, you know, if you walk along the beach, you find little broken pieces of this or that or something. Uh, and those can get buried in, in uh, sediment a little bit easier than whole animals because whole animals tend to be protein that can be eaten at the bottom of the ocean. So that what you're looking at is when you have beautifully preserved whole trilobites, whole anomalocaris, whole hallucinogenia, whole up of any, uh, uh, all of the organisms that are down there, uh, that they got buried suddenly. And in fact, if you read about people who will mm -hmm. say about the um, Burgess Shale or the, uh, or the Chengjiang fossils, they'll usually say this was caused by a slump, an underwater slump, <coughs> where they got suddenly buried. And that's why they're so well preserved. And they're probably right. It's just that it was an underwater slump that was probably mm -hmm. caused by the warm up to the, the flood proper. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I, I think the uh, Genesis flood is a, a much better explanation for the Cambrian explosion than any of the explanations you'll see in the scientific literature. It fits beautifully with that concept. You know, before the flood, we had some seas, and there were animals living there. When the fountains of the Great Deep broke up, and there are different interpretations of what that means, whether it was uh, marine fountains or freshwater fountains. Uh, but uh, at that first uh, beginning, 
uh, these marine organisms were buried, and all these organisms here are marine. In fact, uh, the column remains essentially, uh, what you say, almost exclusively marine, clear up to the Silurian, which again fits very nicely. You don't get terrestrial organisms until you get into the Silurian, which is, I don't know, maybe a two, fifth, two fifth stacks above the. Uh, uh, and it's several Cambrian, sub -stacks It's Cambrian or Division, then you have Silurian, and uh, there you start meeting some, some land organisms. And so, the, according to uh, ecological zonation, uh, the marine material is buried first, and when the uh, continents were attacked, then we started to see some land, plants, and animals in the Silurian. Uh, it kind of fits nicely with the idea of the Genesis flood is described in the Bible. Now, I will point out that it is 11.30, and I know some of you people have to go somewhere. Uh, those of you who want to remain will uh, continue the discussion for a little bit. Uh, but uh, further questions are welcome. And the flood is the flood is the best uh, explanation for also the um, yeah it was oh now I forgot what I was gonna say. Um, something else. well you mentioned the 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 animals but um, oh the Grand Canyon and that kind of thing is the best scientific correct well explanation for the you know I think so obviously yeah. my opinion doesn't <laughs> count much in uh, in uh, the uh, secular literature, so, but but as yeah. far as the er having to do with the erosion uh, timelines and things like that, it's uh, oh yeah, it, it doesn't fit with erosion, and so what else is it? There's no other real uh, yeah choice. I don't think it well, makes any sense. No, I agree. I mean, yeah. uh, Mount Everest still has Paleozoic material on it, and <laughs> standard theory, it shouldn't. It's a lot easier to buy that if uh, there was fairly rapid erosion of Mount Everest because of, you know, like torrential rains and stuff uh, as it's being formed, but not enough to uh, get you uh, uh, 70 million years worth of, uh, of erosion. The Grand Canyon uh, does suggest a major biblical flood activity is extremely widespread formations there, you know. Uh, Kaibab probably running 50,000 square miles, a Hermit Shale 35,000 square miles, uh, Red Wall maybe 45,000 square miles. Uh, these are extremely widespread, flat, non-topographically affected uh, distributions. And the Red Wall itself is divided into four divisions. Uh, you're just talking about a topography of 100 feet here over uh, 45,000 square miles. Uh, I mean, uh, this is uh, so much easier to believe in terms of a uh, flood than uh, uh, gradual development over millions of years as you're moving continents around and doing all this change of environments from moraine to uh, desert and so on. So, uh, And then, of course, the... Uh, Carving of the Grand Canyon is a, a terrific enigma for uh, the Long Ages folks. They've got seven different models there, and uh, what they need is a lot of water, and the flood would certainly provide a lot of water to take care of the great denudation above and the carving of the canyon. Yeah. Well, I think one of the points that Darwin's doubt makes is that even if you give them all the time they want, or try to be fair with it, and and Dar and Steve Meyer makes this point. Hey, thirty million, you know, take eighty million. It doesn't matter. It's not enough time. And um, you know, Marshall makes a proposition. As far as I can tell, it's a fact-free proposition. Maybe the genetic regulatory networks were more flexible back then. Maybe they weren't. Uh, 
What evidence do we have? Well, we need it is not evidence. So <clears throat> did he just make up that idea? Or, or is there actually some evidence in the fossil record that, that there was more flexibility back then? Well, actually, if you want to be precise about that, there's no evidence in the fossil record whatsoever because the evidence that you would need is DNA. Okay. And DNA from that time has been occasionally, well, it's been occasionally reported for 250 million years, uh, but beyond that, it's not been reported. And so unless we find some frozen Cambrian up in uh, Greenland somewhere, uh, it's not likely to be uh, found. And of course, if we did find some frozen uh, uh, DNA in Greenland somewhere, and uh, don't laugh too loud because we actually do have some stuff from uh, Upper Canada that is being analyzed for that very same thing for the Eocene. Um, but, uh, but to get some from the Cambrian would be quite a trick, and it's, uh, we don't see that happening right now. So he made up the idea because he needed it for his argument, as far as which I is can, what we're always being accused of doing. Right. As far as I can tell, that's correct. There's no, there's, there's no er chordate. Uh, uh, developmental gene regulatory network that we have <coughs> been able to project from looking at bony fish and and uh, and sharks and whatever of today and lampreys and saying, oh, this must have been the original. And you know what? That looks like it's more flexible than uh, than what we've got now. No, there's nothing like that as far as I can tell. We need to keep in mind that. Uh both creationists and do and scientists or evolutionists, maybe I should say, uh, hypothesize. Oh, I and think. you're free to it's hypothesize. It's just that hypothesis is not a uh, defense. It, uh, but uh, the thing is, uh, how close to the facts does your hypothesis fit? And uh, there's a lot more data that fits. Uh, with the creation model than is allowed in the scientific literature. Well, yeah. And, and I think this is the key. Whenever you get somebody who says, oh, but this happened back then, the first question you ask is, how do you know? And if there's no answer to that, then they're pulling it out of their nether regions or something. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, we, we like to talk and evaluate these things, but we must uh, not forget to evaluate. Another, another thing I remember spoken of in this, uh, gone over very thoroughly in this class, was the, uh, I forget, it's called flat something, where the, the lines of the sediment are, are flat, virtually, whereas if it was um, ero Paraconformities. erosion. Paraconformities, you're looking at the expert there. Huh? Oh, <laughs> well, it's called flat something, right? Isn't it? Anyway, flat gaps. Flat gaps. Flat gaps. <laughs> flat gaps. Yes, thank you. The, thank you. the technical Appreciate term that. is paraconformities. Yeah, Jogging yeah. my memory. Here. This is this is a worldwide phenomenon that is, uh, to me, one of the most convincing arguments against the long geologic time scale. Because I think the only thing you can tweak it with is soft sediment f deformation at those paraconformities, and and that just pretty well nails it. Well, you, you you find it that you've seen the in the Capitol Reef, for instance. Yeah, uh, and uh, in Arizona, uh, north of Flagstaff, uh, it looks like those things were soft, and supposed to be millions of years between the layers. It's. Uh, and then there's the columns uh, that uh, is that Capitol Reef also or. Uh, you mean the, the pipes and the yeah. uh, Kodachrome Basin? Kodachrome Basin, that's what it yeah, is. Yeah, no, that's a little... Where uh, the, <clears> the, the, <throat> the bottom layer was liquid enough to actually it's, have uh, extruded into the top layer. Triassic stuff. Uh, 
<clears throat> they're in Kodachrome Basin and the uh, Jurassic stuff. It, some Navajo was involved in it and so on. Uh, so, no, that, you find what you look for to a certain extent. I uh, keep that in mind, but if you start looking for this stuff, you can find a lot of evidence for support the Bible. You know, in my opinion, there's no excuse for any Adventist or for that matter, conservative Christian to get through school without knowing about paraconformities and soft sediment deformation. Those are things that they just should, they just should know exist and then get to struggle with trying to fit them into long age or get to say, you know, this is one of the reasons why I can't buy long age. These, uh, these paraconformities, they blow your mind over, over the world where they're so common and uh, the laser is so flat, it's just what you'd expect during a, f a major flood. It is totally what you'd not expect over long ages. Then should we perhaps not, uh, never mind, I don't think. But should we perhaps not have uh, once every three months or so, kind of, this is what we believe? Uh, actually, uh, uh, that's yeah, that's right. not a bad idea to see where are we at now. According to the, the here's here's the seven evidences that we think uh, every Adventist ought to have, and here's what's happened to them in the meantime. Uh, not not bad idea. Kind of like a presidential debate or something. So we both, you know, the public uh, open to the public essentially, <laughs> so that the public hears both sides of the argument so it's state of creation review well uh, maybe after we get done with the last chapter of this and whatever Dr. Milishenko has to say uh, we'll try to pull one of those together and uh, and make some you know just outline of what what's the, what are the evidences and what they uh, and what's the what's new about them? And I think it's Just a minute, we have a comment back here. <laughs> Capture this on tape here. I mean, uh, we are not. He and I are discussing this, and, and the feeling is every three months things don't change that fast. Seems like it'd be awfully repetitive and hence boring. I mean, I, to be able to to expose different regions of the country or the world. Science moves fairly slow. Uh, that is sometimes true. Where, where it starts to move, I think we should, we should bring that in uh, okay. as, it, as yeah. it happens. But you, you may be right that, uh, that once a year may be more optimal than every three months simply because uh, it'll be, oh, I heard this one before. Well, I mean, it seems to me as though there's some Found, there's sort of some foundational points uh, which everybody should know. They should be exposed to it at least once. Uh, and then there's like news. What's, what's the latest developments? And to me, those are two different things to be handled in different ways. The news might be fairly frequent. You know, that could be, you know, every, every so many months. However, whenever it pops up. The, the, the foundational things, I think it's worthwhile to sort of repeat those on occasion, but maybe every three years in, the, in an area or something like that. And uh, entitle it something and then have it kind of sit off by itself. And then when we do the foundational thing, but, but it should be something that's available and, and easily well, indexable. We could take a page from Al Gore, and that is to, to produce, you know, we could, we could um, uh, produce sort of a, a glossy slideshow sort of thing with a script that anybody could be trained to be able to present anywhere. Uh, mind you, they wouldn't be experts. They wouldn't be able to necessarily handle all questions that might come up afterwards. But, but then Al Gore isn't an expert anyway, so. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, let me, let me just uh, comment to something previously, and that is, I mean, there, uh, and I'm not sure if this is said uh, in response, but you know, why, why think that the, the networks are, um, uh, uh, can be more easily changed back then than now by reverse, reverse thinking. Uh, if evolution is true, uh, then 
Uh, we started very simply and got to very complex, so you'd expect the first animal forms to be uh, simple in their regulatory network. Um, uh, and therefore, even though we don't have any direct evidence, just by sort of logical <coughs> assumption, uh, then it must be simpler. Yes. Uh, this question of uh, were there fewer, was less competition back there in the Cambrian is uh, mitigated a little bit by uh, Gould's idea of uh, there were uh, more basic types in the Cambrian than there are now. So well, certainly we don't have a, uh, any organisms that are in the phylum of hallucinogenia. Well, you know, it's uh, you, Paleozoic. You, know, you got so many different kinds of organisms that we don't have now at present. That's where, and Mesozoic, you know, you still have a lot of diversity there also uh, compared to the few groups that we have now living. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure that uh, the, the argument of lack of diversity is very strong. I think he was making a God of the Gaps argument. <clears throat> What's that? I think he was making a God of the Gaps argument. He didn't have any evidence, so you know he just proposed well, <laughs> something uh, without that evidence. Is a that is a valid criticism. A God of the Gaps stands in contrast with evolution of the Gaps. Well, the, Wait, yeah, the Darwin of the Gaps? Yeah. yeah. Um, but I'm a little bit puzzled about this uh, suggestion that because things were simpler, they were more flexible. More flexibility usually involves higher complexity. Uh, you, you see, not less. So the simpler the system, the more vulnerable it is to perturbations because it doesn't have the capacity to respond in all the appropriate ways. Uh, that is a very basic concept. So when people argue both for simplicity as well as flexibility simultaneously, that that troubles me somewhat because I, I'm 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 um, puzzled as to where you expect the flexibility to come from. Well, it, um, if you think about the evolution, where you have um, where you have a species and then what happens through genetic damage, they're narrowed and narrowed into a specific niche. Um, Blind cave fish can only exist in caves. Yeah. So um, it seems to me as uh, if you're losing genetic data, you're becoming more simple, and, and yet you're becoming inflexible. Uh, and inflexible. So simplicity is associated with inflexibility, yep, yep. not more flexibility. Uh, God of the gaps uh, argument has been mentioned several times, and uh, I think we need to uh, analyze and uh, work on that argument. It, it, by itself, it can destroy science. Uh, anything that you don't understand, well, God did it. Uh, this is not what we notice, we know that science works, we know that the laws of science, and so on. We believe that God created the laws of science which permit science to be possible. Uh, and so I, I, I think uh, uh, it would help if we would consider the fact that uh, God of the gaps is too general a term to be used. Uh, and sometimes in the literature I've seen God of the necessary gaps. I'm more comfortable with that term than with the broad term, uh, you know, deus ex machina, uh, idea that any time in the study you want something, God comes down and he does it. Uh, that destroys science. Uh, but we know science works. And it's highly successful in certain areas and gives a lot of good data and a lot of marginal interpretations at times. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm much more comfortable with a term like God of the Necessary Gaps. For the origin of life, uh, I, I, I feel comfortable thinking God did that. Yeah, I, uh, I think that, that, that you have to distinguish between the kinds of gaps, and there are two, there's two distinctions. Number one is uh, 
the evidence for those gaps. Mm -hmm. If you have almost no <laughs> evidence, you're probably better off starting to look for some kind of naturalistic filler. But the number <laughs> two thing, and that's important, is does it, does it have theological significance? That is to say, <laughs> the, if the gaps are God-shaped, then it makes a mo lot more sense to call God of the gaps than if the uh, gaps are just simply whatever. I think a little analysis of um, what we mean by God of the gaps would be very helpful. Yeah. Well, uh, next week it will be announced what happens. Uh, is well, I was wondering um, if in the new earth or in heaven uh, we continue doing science. We're not going to invoke God of the gaps every time we don't understand something, are we? No, so but I think that we'll probably have some, um, some evidence as to where it's appropriate. Well, yes, but what I'm saying is it, it, that the question is not so much whether God did it, but rather how he did something, how were things arranged to function so that it would actually work? Uh, can we understand the original intent? That is where the real research ought to go. Instead of this business of, uh, oh, well, we don't understand something, God must have done it. That, that's that's uh, 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 doing science in heaven where the funding isn't quite as much. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There, there, there. Boy, you've hit that nail on the head now. One of the most exciting parts about it. That's right. Yeah. Just think, no grant proposals. That's right. Con concerning gaps for a minute, I mean, the um, everything, like you said, is going to have a gap until it's been proven where there's no gaps. And uh, the, the point here is to look at how far is the leap between the gap. I mean, if you got a leap for, to believe in Darwinism, Darwinist theories, and you got a leap a thousand miles versus uh, with God in the picture, you, you're, it's like a stepping stone. Yes, there's gaps, but you know, you can logically see the steps. In, in fact, whatever has the least distance between the gaps should, in all honesty, being a, uh, going out on a limb here, a little during, uh, considering the, the, the present, uh, the present envir science, scientific environment in our society today, but uh, being honest, a, a, what I would consider and should be considered a, a, a honest and good scientist would pick the least uh, you know, the most logical explanation for something as the most popular theory. Not the, not the one that is, at least down the road, quite a, quite a ways, uh, as far as, as, far as what, what really fits the evidence. Well, let me just quickly respond. It seems to me as though God can bridge any gap, small or large. So he's always, it's always the easiest explanation. Well, I'm, I'm looking at it from a pure scientific viewpoint, not a theological one. Um, that's why I'm saying a, a good scientist is going to take the most, uh, the, the theory at least, until it, there is no gaps, it's still a theory, right? You know, can, looking at it like that. So you want to you wanna look at what, is the, what has the most evidence. This is like a, a court of law. What, what is, you know, what fits best? And if the evidence supports that, that theory, whatever, whatever, whatever the, the, the evidence fits best, you know, there's more evidence that would, that would align with that theory, then that theory should be the, the best guess you've got under, under the, uh, you know, under, under the guise of gaps, under the, uh, uh, the, the category of theories. It should be the one that's chosen as the most likely, being that it has the most evidence to support it. Simple. That's why when one day this is solid science, 
few, several years later on, is no longer solid science because there's more uh, evidence to even dump it. See, what used to be one day solid is not. Whereas the Bible has withstood the way of time. Well, if it was the other way around, say if it was less evidence supporting God's way, then they could claim to uh, that, okay, you're believing in that because of your faith. But because it's the opposite, we can actually s tell them that they're believing in Darwinist theories because of their faith in Darwinist theories. So. Yeah. Well, we'll see you guys next week then. Um, and uh, I'll announce it on the uh, on the uh, uh, on the email as to what it'll be as soon as I know for sure what it is. <laughs>